are so glad that you have joined us for church today. We've got an awesome service planned for you and we're now going to be going into worship and we'd love you to sing along. Just one word, here come the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch. My eyes were open to see, my heart can't help but believe There's nothing that I God can do There's not a mountain that He can move Oh, we'll praise the name that makes a way There's nothing that I God can do Just one word you hear what's broken inside me Just one word And you revive every dream Just one touch I feel the power of heaven Just one touch my eyes were open to see, my heart can't help but believe There's nothing that our God can do There's not a mountain that He can move Oh, praise the name that makes a way There's nothing that our God can do There's nothing that our God can do there's not a prison wall he can break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that a God can do. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree, there's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree. There's no power like His power. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a prison boy he can break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that he can move. Oh, praise the name. There's nothing that Jesus can do
Philippians 2, verse 6 to 11 says this. It says, Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Christ Jesus is Lord. It's amazing, isn't it? Here is a name that is given that is above all other names. Names have limitations. We know that in our lives, in and in around uh, the people we've known through our life. Maybe you look at sporting heroes or movie stars or all these names that have been in the past. They've had their moment in the lights and in the glitz, if you like, and, and then they've just faded into history, literally. Some of them may be still around, but they haven't, they haven't got the... Um, the, the, uh, the news feed uh, pumping out their names anymore. It's just that they've been and they've done. But Jesus, his name has stood the test of time. His name has been around and we still talk, we still, uh, we still sing about him, we still worship him, we still read stories about him in the Bible, we still, we still want to uh, be in his presence as we've just sung. Because his name brings strength. His name brings guidance. His name brings healing. It sustains. It gives us peace and joy and love. And of course, it forgives. I wonder if you're in a position today where you're watching this, that you're in a relationship already with him. I hope that you are. That's our prayer that you are. And if you're not, I wonder if you'd be open to the possibility that maybe that you could have a relationship with Jesus. We believe that he died. We know he died. You could say, oh, it's just history then, but it isn't history because he rose again and he sits at the right hand of God. That's what this is all about. It's all about Jesus. What we do here online is all about Jesus. And we want to invite you in to a relationship with him. Warm welcome to you, wherever you are, you know, where you're watching this and I hope you're enjoying it I hope you've uh, you're, you're getting something from it uh, and we love to 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 see um, so many people coming online uh, to meet in this sort of format still so I just want to pray before we go on into the next part of our service and then uh, I'm just going to do that right now so God we just thank you Lord that we can still meet in this way Lord together and I pray God that you just use this a platform to bless so many, Lord, that you would help us to grow in you, Lord, that you would just uh, draw us more deeper into your presence, God, Lord, that we want to just, um, just cement our relationship more with you, God. We thank you for what you do and what you've done, Lord. We pray, God, that you would just, you would just, just speak to us today, Lord. Speak into our hearts. Touch us in places, God, in our hearts that we didn't know were there, Lord. Break down any walls or barriers, Lord, as this 
message comes out now, Lord, as this, as this preach comes out, Father, I pray, Lord, that your words that you speak through, Christian, Lord, would be and um, would be breaking into us, Lord, that would just be uh, revealing, Lord, that it would be um, just um, uplifting, God. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, you'd have your way with us today, Lord, in your name. Amen. Amen. Yes, good, good to be together, guys. And we just want you to get ready now for another great preach. Get your pens ready, get your notebooks ready, because there's going to be a great message coming up right now. Thank you, Tim, for that great encouragement. We've got loads of exciting things happening here at Arena. Every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 a.m., we have our upper Zoom. And this is our early morning prayer, which runs on Zoom, and we'd love to see you on it. On the 6th of July at 7 p.m. over Zoom, we have our first Tuesday. This is a great time together. We love these nights at Arena. It's a time of prayer and we hear a short word and also a great encouragement and we would love to see you on it. From July, we will be only having one church online service. So instead of having our 10.30 a.m. and our 6 p.m., it now will just be our 10.30 a.m. service. We'd still love to see you on it and we're so excited that we have our church online family. There's loads of information about who we are on the website and there's a connect card. If you're new and you've recently found us, we would love for you to get connected to Arena through that. There's also a prayer request section. If you've got a need, one of our team at Arena would love to be praying for you. And there's also a praise report section. If there's something amazing that God's done in your life, we would love to hear about it. There's lots of ways that you can give and they're all found on the Church Online page too. We're now going into our Minute Mingle, so if you'd like to take this time, say hello to in your house, or we have the online chat where you can connect with one of us, and then we'll be hearing from our lead pastor, Christian. Welcome everyone, it's great to be able to share God's Word with you today. If it's your first time amongst us, we really do give you a very, very warm welcome and uh, we trust you've enjoyed the worship and the lead and we want to say that Arena Church is a great place to be. It's filled with very ordinary people but many of them are doing extraordinary things and I know that you'll have an amazing welcome if you choose to remain online or if you come to one of our in-person services, I'm sure you, will be, uh, you won't be disappointed. We're one church in seven locations and uh, I love the fact that we've planted out to the north and to the south and to the east and to the west. And um, may I ask us just to continue to pray for every location. We really do want to encourage people to come back uh, two in-persons, the numbers are most definitely swelling and growing and uh, it's also great to see lots of new people in our locations too. We've been in a great series called Body Beautiful. Normally people would be getting themselves ready to go on a summer holiday. We're all going on a summer... No, we'll leave that one for a moment. People are going on summer holidays and of course there's still re many restrictions uh, around uh, travel and foreign travel, but uh, people get their bodies ready, and uh, we just wanted to really have a play on that of Body Beautiful. It's been a great series because the reason why we talk Body Beautiful is the church is described in many ways through the scriptures, through the Bible. It's described, for instance, as an army. It's, it's described as a family, but it's also described as a body. Jesus being the head and we being the body parts, the, the, the body that makes it work here on earth. 
And over the last few weeks, we've been looking at the connectivity, our connectivity to, to Jesus and to one another. Our diversity, how we're all very different and how we all should bring our unique gifts and offer them in service to God and to our world. We also looked at maturity, how it needs to grow up. But today, in the final part of this series, I want to look at Body Beautiful and its vitality. Get a pad and a pen, you'll definitely need it. As we, as we work through this, it's vitality. What, what, what I'm really uh, looking at in this is how he grows. This is, what he, this is what it says in 1 Corinthians 12, and verse 27. He says, now you are speaking to every Christian. And if you're not a Christian here today, please keep listening. Because at the end of this uh, time together, I want to invite you. You'll hear some thoughts of God's love towards you. And uh, there'll, there'll be a response that I want to, if I, if I may, draw from you. So please stay with me. But there's many people who are here who are Christians, listening as, as, as disciples of Jesus. And this is the instruction and, 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 and uh, helpful encouragement to you is, now you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. We're all part of the body of Christ. Doesn't matter who we are, where we are, how low we think of ourselves. You are a valuable and intrinsic and precious part of the body of Christ. And the church of Jesus, as I've said, is, is meant to be overflowing, um, pulsating. Let me use a word. I don't even know whether it's an English word. I know vivacious is, but it should be have a vivaciousness. It's full of life and attractiveness. It's full of strength and health. And these qualities and characteristics that need to be in not just our own lives, but also in the body of Christ, it, it produces growth. You see, the, the purpose of the body is to grow. If you have a child who is stunted in their growth, a, a doctor, a consultant will say there is a problem because children are meant to grow. They're meant to grow. And this growth in the body of Christ comes from its connectivity, its diversity, and its maturity. And that's why we've addressed these things. But in this particular message today, I want to look at growth. But here's a question. Let me ask you this question. What do you want to grow in your life? And what do you want from your life? So what, what do you want to grow in your life? And what do you want to grow from your life? And that question is very, very important because people want to grow in all kinds of areas. But, you know, I'm going to encourage us throughout this message to grow in three particular areas. And we'll come to that in a short while. But growth in a plant comes as a result, not of the leaves, but of the root. You know, we've got some very, very keen gardeners in our church. And we've actually got one gentleman who has... Uh, uh, works professionally in the, in the industry, in the horticultural industry, and he's actually uh, re being represented at the Chelsea Flower Show. That's a big deal, by the way. And if you were to talk to him and keen gardeners, they would say it's very important that we give careful attention to the root. You see, root produces fruit. Everybody say that with me. Root produces fruit. It's so important that when a gardener would look at the roots, they would make sure that they are kept clean. They're well watered. They're nurtured. They're nourished. They're protected from insects. And particularly in the cold, the frost. I remember planting something just before we were really coming out of the frost. I thought I'd planted it well enough. A week or so later, I realized the frost had got to the roots and had killed the plants. Therefore, it was not able to produce any fruit in the days ahead. You see, the root produces the fruit. And if we want to see our places, our relationships, our homes, our cities, our towns flourish and grow in, it all comes from the root. Proverbs 11 verse 10 actually says it this way. When speaking of a city, it says, when the righteous thrive, the city rejoices. That is talking about the righteous root in a city. You see, it's possible to have, even in our cities and our towns, righteousness to be at the very heart of a town and a city. 
And then the city rejoices. Why? Because of the root of righteousness. I really believe that it's important that we give careful attention to the roots, the foundations of our lives. Because from our internal being, not just the external, we need to look after the external, but we need to give careful attention to the internal workings of our lives. And as we do so, this is where growth comes. Now what I've realized is this, there are many people who do not attend In fact, they unattend to their roots and their foundations. They give no attention to the internal workings of a man's soul, a man's heart. It's very blasé. Que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. I'm going to do it my way. I'll do it my... I feel like wanting to break out into song all the time, so watch out, guys. It's because X Factor's not on. I don't know what happened there. But anyway, you know... People don't give any attention to their roots, their foundations, their internal workings, the man's soul. And so the root produces, let me give you some examples of this. You know, people have the root of pride. And the root of pride will produce entitlement and arrogance. The root of jealousy, while this produces resentment and mistrust. The root of lust. This produces perversions and sexual unfulfillment. The root of anger. Well, this produces quarreling and violence. And we can see it in society where there's a root of these things and it always produces a fruit. Unfortunately, it's always negative. But in Jesus, as believers, let me give you some examples of this. If we have a root of teachability, we are committed to work in teachability in our life. We will listen. We will lean in. Then it will produce humility. If we have a root of surrendered, where we give everything to Jesus and we really mean it, this will produce the fullness of life. Jesus said, if you lose your life, you'll gain your life. If the root of prayer, as we gather at upper, upper Zooms, In the mornings, on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 7 a.m., as we gather at first Tuesdays, as we gather at prayer gatherings, this, as we we pray on our own, this root of prayer produces an interdependency with God and we trust Him more. A root of forgiveness, where we take the, 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 the scriptures of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, this produces peace and we're free. Have you got it? Root produces fruit. If we want to grow, if we want to have vitality in our own lives, we must make sure that we give careful attention to the roots of our lives. Don't leave anything unattended. Equally in the body of Christ, body beautiful, we must make sure that we give attention collectively to the root because the roots will produce the fruit. And in essence, this message and this series has been addressing the issue of discipleship. Discipleship, somebody who learns, becomes like Jesus. Now, many people say, well, I've been on a discipleship course and I did six weeks. That's great, but that is not discipleship because discipleship is a journey. Some people who wanted to shortcut it, they want seven steps to get closer to Jesus. They want to have three steps how to read the Bible. They want to have the dummy guide to, to, to developing people. Let me, let me tell you, those materials may be helpful, but in itself, they're, they're, they're not the entire thing. You see, discipleship is a process. It's a journey as God speaks to us. Now, many of you have said yes to Jesus and you've raised your hand even online and you've leaned in and you've heard this message of grace and that's wonderful. But that is just the first part. That is called salvation. Let me tell you, salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you everything you have. Yes, salvation is free. You come to Jesus for free. You can't buy your way in. You can't earn your way in. You can't schmooze your way in. It only comes as a free gift and we receive it. But discipleship will cost you everything you have. And that is what I find that many people stay at the point of the cross, but they never move forward into discipleship. And that is why people enter into, let me just give you this phrase, cheap grace. 
You see, cheap grace is grace without discipleship. (laughs) It's grace without discipleship. Jesus was a man full of grace and truth. And that grace and truth produces discipleship. Because there are some things that we have to learn and lean into and understand and allow God's dealings in our hearts. And that brings us to become better people. Can I say this? More like Jesus. And that is called discipleship. I love what Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 24. Just turn with me. Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple, if anyone would come after me, you must first deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. You see, it's not just about salvation. We want you to enter into salvation in Jesus. There's no other way to God but through Jesus But we want to enter into the journey of discipleship, which means you will deny yourself. It will mean you will come after him. You'll run after him, Jesus. You'll die to yourself and you'll follow him continuously. So this is an honest series, a call to discipleship. Listen to me, if you're young today, it's a call to discipleship. If you're older today, it's a call to discipleship. If you've been around the church for yonks, it's a call to discipleship. If you've only just started calling Arena Church home, it's a call to discipleship. Because as we enter into this journey of discipleship, we will pulsate with vitality. Yes, there will be things that God just works with us. Rough edges, he works with us, but it will lead us into a freedom and a joy that is unending. So I am really wanting to help you as your tour guide today to enter into the journey of growing in the body of Christ. And I want to take two key verses that we're going to explore for a moment And then we're going to address three particular things that come from these verses. We see instructions of what we must grow in. So let's read them together, shall we? In 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 12, and these are in the New Testament. If you do not have a Bible, please let us know. One of the hosts know. Contact our office. We will send you a physical Bible but we would encourage you to be in your Bibles. And if you are new to Jesus, we'd encourage you to begin by reading the New Testament. Read about Jesus. Read about Jesus. Your life will be changed. But we see in 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 12, this is what it says. And may the Lord increase, grow. That's what the original word also means. Grow your love. Until it overflows towards one another and for all people, just as our love overflows towards you. We're to grow in love, but also to Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. Peter writes to the uh, scattered Christians and he says, But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. We see here in these two separate verses, one of the great leaders of the church at that time, Paul, gives an instruction to the church and Peter. Both of them give instructions. And they give instructions instructions for us to grow in three areas. There are more areas, but I really believe that these are foundational. So I want to encourage you, first of all, number one, grow in love. Grow in love. This is the basis of the gospel. If you're new today and you're thinking, what really is the gospel all about? I want to tell you, it's God coming to earth through Jesus, his son, out of love. It's the basis of the gospel. God so loved the world. It's the root of our foundations. It's the root of our message. And it's the gospel of love. I was listening recently to something. There was an evangelist by the name of Billy Graham. And he preached probably to more people in the modern world than anybody else. And somebody was saying of him, 
on his last message, he stood up and he turned to the huge stadium crowds and he said to the left, God loves you. And he went over to this side, God loves you. And in the middle, God loves you. And he said over to his right, God loves you. It was the message that he wanted to preach and get out. And of course, when Jesus was on the earth, he spoke about this love. It's the very essence of God. God is love. And we are called to grow in love. Matthew 22, verse 37 to 40. Just turn to it on your own. But basically, Jesus says the first and greatest commandment is this. To love God with your whole heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your soul, and your entire being. To love God. To grow in this love. And then he said the second commandment is this. Go and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And your neighbor was everybody. This love is not some superficial, mushy, even a love that's like a husband and wife, a sexual love. No, this love, this love is a love that serves, that, that, that supports. That we're meant to grow in the love of friendship. We're meant to have a love that honors, that forgives when people do us wrong. We forgive them. A love that defends A love that protects. We're called to grow in love. This is part of our discipleship. And it's a challenge. Husbands, love your wives with this kind of love. By the way, wives, love your husbands. Oh, you may say, really? (laughs) Have you seen my husband? No. But we're still called to love with this kind of love. Parents, love your children. With this kind of love, even the wayward ones, even the difficult ones, even the ones who won't behave, even the the ones who have slammed the door in your face, we're called to love them. And can I say, children, you're called to love your parents, even when you think they're stupid, even though you think you don't know what they're on about, and they do. You're called to love them. Pastors, love your people. Leaders, love your people with all your heart. Lay your life down for the sheep. That is what we call about. I have to say that's my love for Arena Church. To, to love you. But also, people, can you love your pastors? You may see even the irritating one with the white shirt and we often see online. Yeah, even that one. <laughs> love. We're meant to grow in love. To sum it all up, Jesus says in John 13 verse 34, let me give you a new command. Love one another in the same way that I loved you. You love one another. And then Jesus goes on to say and says, and if you'll do this, this is how people will recognize that you're my disciples when they see the love that you have for one another. This love will correct. This love will challenge. This love will at times fall out, but this love will not allow the falling out to separate us. This love will forgive This love will deal with issues. We're meant to grow in love. We're meant to grow in love. And as we do so, we'll be identified. Can I also say as well, guys, it's important that we don't just love those people who are attractive, who are aimable, who are our friends and our family. They're probably easier. But we're called to grow in love with the spiteful. What about the hateful? What about the difficult What about the confused? What about the dirty? And I'm talking physically dirty. What about those who are different? What about those who are my enemies? We're called to love them all. You may say, Christian, that's so difficult. I try, I try, I try. I know I get it. I've done it. The only way you can do it is just by simply saying, Jesus, Jesus, pour your love into my life that I can then extend it to others. And the other prayer that I pray is, God, I choose to love. It's an act of the will. It's a choice. Because love is the crux. It's the message of the gospel. This is what St. Augustine said as I just go to the second point. What does love look like? It has hands to help others. It has the feet to hasten to the poor and needy. It has eyes to see misery and want. It has ears to hear the sighs and sorrows of men. This is what love looks like 
We are called to increase in our love, as Thessalonians tells us, so that it overflows towards one another and for all people. Secondly, we're called to grow in grace. 2 Peter 3 verse 18, but grow in the grace of our Lord Jesus I want to define it this way because it can be defined in many ways, grace. This grace for me is a joy-filled, delightful, sweet and charming value and characteristic. You know when you are in the presence of grace. If I can say this, I have four children, they're all delightful and the kids won't be upset with me saying this, but our youngest Lilia is renowned for a grace. She just carries such a sweet and charming and delightful um, value and characteristics that even the school have recognized. This grace is expressed through speech. The words of grace are honoring, they're affirming, they're encouraging, and, they're, and they are bold. Let me give you a verse, Proverbs 16, verse 24. It says this, gracious words are a honeycomb sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. This growing in grace, you will speak stuff that will bring healing to people's bones. It's also a grace that expresses love and kindness, compassion and forgiveness to a broken world, listen to me, with no strings attached. You just express grace to the brokenness of humanity. Never expecting anything in return. But it's also a grace that is ever mindful of the mercies of God. At its very core, it understands that we have received the grace of God. In his book, Moral Lessons, Richard Salser, who is a medical doctor in the States, writes of the story of the wife and the crooked smile. Just let me take a moment to just uh, read this story to you. He writes, I stand by the bed where a young woman lies, her face, face post-operative and her mouth twisted in palsy. It's clownish. And a tiny twig of the facial nerve, the one of the muscles of the mouth, has been severed. She will be like this from now on. The surgeon had followed with religious fervor the curve of her flesh. I promise you that. Nevertheless, to remove the tumor in her cheek, I had to cut the little nerve. A young husband is in the room. He stands on the opposite side of the bed, and together they seem to dwell in the evening lamplight, isolated from me, private. Who are they, I ask myself, him and this wry mouth that I have made, who gaze at and touch each other so generously, greedily. The young woman speaks. Will my mouth always be like this? She asks. Yes, I say, it will. It is because the nerve was cut. She nods and is silent, but the Young man smiles. I like it, he says. It's kind of cute. All at once I know who he is. I understand and I lower my gaze. Unmindful, he bends to kiss her crooked mouth. And I am so close I can see how he twists his own lip to accommodate hers. To show her that their kiss still works. This is the wonderful grace of God. God reaches down and looks beyond our brokenness and disfigurement. And kisses our crooked mouths. May we do the same to this broken world. But we're also finally called to grow in knowing. Let me take you back to 2 Peter in chapter 3 and verse 18. Here we see the instruction, but grow also 
in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Now, interesting, the English translation uses the word knowledge. But the original Greek text, which the New Testament was written in, uses a far different word. The word that it uses is knowing. You see, knowledge speaks of information, but knowing speaks of intimacy. We're not encouraged to grow in our information. We're encouraged to grow in our intimacy. You see, the word there of knowledge is gnosis, to know intimately. It's like a man would know their wife. A wife would know their husband. They know one another intimately. So let's read it this way. 2 Peter 3 verse 8 says this, Keep growing in your knowing. Have you got that? Keep growing in your knowing. Now, we run something called Growth Track. And we encourage people to come on Growth Track. And if you want to know more about it, then I'd encourage you, please reach out to the office and we can help you to know how you can go through that. And we help people to know God. That's the first part. Find freedom, discover their purpose and make a difference. But it all starts with knowing God. And we use this illustration when I teach it. I often say, you know what people think? They say, yeah, I know about God. I know who God is. And I use the example. Well, I've been reading recently a book about the late Kobe Bryant. There was a gift from Jonathan and Annie. He was a claim basketballer. I, I, I've read about his upbringing, his schooling. I, I know his children's names. I know his wife's name. I could say, well, I know him, but I don't. I know of him. I don't know him. You see, I don't know, really know what he's like. I, I don't know about his schooling. I don't know what his favorite foods were like. I don't, I don't know what his favorite way when he was on the earth of relaxing. I don't know what character he really was like. This is all reserved for those who know him intimately. It's the same with God. Same with God. You know, you may say, well, I know about him. I know religion. That's part of the problem. I've been to a religious school. Catholic, Anglican, wherever it may be. I know the good book. But you don't know him. You don't know him intimately. You see, people are forever pursuing information without intimacy. Connections without connectivity. But this gospel is a gospel of knowing. He wants us to grow in our knowing. He wants us to have a relationship with him. He wants us to enter into intimacy with, with the divine, with, with our Father. And I have a promise that I hold on to, and I've known it since being a young man. And the Bible verse is this, as I draw near to God, God will draw near to me. One writer by the name of Brennan writing, he said this, You will trust God only as much as you love him, and you will love him to the extent you have touched him. Rather that he has touched you. You see, as we reach out to God, God touches us. It's interesting with this thought of growing in our knowing. And time escapes. I have so much more that I could say around this. But one of the challenges, and we addressed this many, many weeks ago to our relationship with God, is hurry. The challenge to knowing God in my life is hurry. On Monday I read from Psalm 40 verse 1. Turn with me for a moment. And it says there, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned and heard my cry. And in that moment, moment, I knew that God was wanting to say something to me. And as I delved deeper into the passage, I noticed that the Hebrew words, because the Old Testament is written in the Hebrew, for wait and patiently are the same word. There's no difference. Wait and patient. So I waited patiently. In the English, that's a different, but they're, they're the same word. And in essence, the psalmist was saying this, wait, wait. When something is repeated in the scriptures, it's very, very important. In life, it's very important. And what the psalmist was saying here, wait with concentration, with focus, with intentionality. Until he comes. I felt the encouragement in that moment to just Wait, wait upon the Lord. But it was interesting, the following day, Caroline sent me a WhatsApp message. And uh, she sent a verse to me. She didn't know about this encounter that I had the previous morning. 
And she sent me a verse. Please turn with me to Psalm 27 verse 14. And this is what it writes. And she felt it strongly for me. Wait on the Lord. (laughs) Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. You can imagine I felt like God was getting my attention because in this verse 2, there are two weights. There are two weights. God is wanting me to wait, 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 wait upon the Lord. He's wanting me to grow in my knowing. It's only as I wait that I truly know his presence. So I'd encourage you guys, the body beautiful for us to grow. Yes, we need to grow. God wants us to grow. Not just numerically, but he wants us to grow in our hearts. But he wants us to grow in our love. He wants us to grow in our grace. And he wants us to grow in our knowing, in our intimacy with him. You see, it's so easy to settle, to get comfortable and to become lazy. It's been very easy over this COVID season to do that. And the call to us as his church at Arena is to grow, to grow in love to grow in grace, to grow in the knowing, to love God with all of our hearts, to embrace the brokenness of this world and for us to commit, to recommit to the family of God called his church. In these closing moments, I wonder if you'd join with me in prayer. Thank you for being with me for this message. You may be here today and you want to experience his grace For you to really know him. You may know a little bit about him. You may know much about him. But you don't really know him. I'm talking of Jesus. And Jesus today says to you. I have come. I have come to take away your sins. I have come to heal you and forgive you. And I have come that you may have a relationship with me. And I wonder if you join with me. Because if that's your heart prayer today. That you want to know Jesus in this way. I wonder if you would join with me in this prayer. Just simply say with me, Jesus, I want to know you like that. Come into my life. May I know you. Take away my sins. I confess all my sins before you. I bring them before you. And I recognize that you are the savior of my life, of the world. Come into my life. Change me. Heal me. Help me. And they ask this in Jesus' name. Friend, can I say, if you have prayed that prayer, then you have begun the journey of salvation. Of course, it comes to discipleship, but it's the first beginning. And I'd encourage you now to click on the screen. I'd encourage you now to let one of the hosts know. I'd encourage you now, even if you're not quite bold enough, just to send a message into the offices. Someone wants to help you on the journey in faith. It's the very beginning of your journey to knowing God. What a great thing it is. But also there's many people who may say, like me, I want to grow in these areas. If that's you today, just join with me. Father, we want to grow in love. We want to grow in grace. We want to grow in the things of God. We want to become more like you. We want to grow in our intimacy with you. Help us, we pray. Cause there there to be an explosion in our hearts of discipleship that we run and pursue you. And Lord, as we do this and as we do these things, you will change us from the inside out and we will change our world. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I've been praying a prayer. Father, change me. Heal me, mold me, fill me, and use me. Why? So I can become more like him. I pray that will be your prayer too. Guys, body beautiful. Let's keep growing in the things of God. Next Sunday we have a great beginning of a new series. I'm not going to give it to you because I want you to be have great anticipation. It's going to be amazing. But in the meantime... And over this course of this week, I pray that you'll be blessed and that you'll know the presence of God in your life. But as always, I like to leave you with these statements. Guys, I love you. I am praying for you. And I really do believe in you. God bless you. 
Yeah, great message, brilliant message. Great to have that encouragement from Christian today. And I hope you've had something from that. You've been able to take something from it. And don't forget, if uh, you want to listen to that uh, back or listen to it again, you can go uh, to our website, download that from our um, podcast section. Now, as you can with, with any of the messages that we have uh, we have broadcasted online. Um, so good good that we've been able to, to be together. Good that we've been able to just meet and worship and, and get something from uh, God's Word. You know, we're, we have a part in the service which we uh, call our giving or our tithes and offering. Uh, and it is going to be done, obviously, online, electronically, uh, because of this uh, this position we find ourselves on here. Uh, there's going to be a link on the screen and uh, follow that as you can. But it's all part of our worship. This is all part of our giving, our response to to what uh, to who God is and what he's done for us. So we'd encourage you to keep doing that. We thank you for your faithfulness in doing that. And um, the giving online has been has been phenomenal, uh, to say the least. Um, so we're going to sing one more song. The link's going to come up uh, on the screen. Uh, I'm just going to go for it one more time in our worship as we as we sing. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, <laughs> there is freedom. Um, let's do it one more time, guys. to the wild and don't be afraid run into wide open spaces grace is waiting for you dance like the weight has been lifted grace is waiting where the spirit of the lord is there is freedom there is the spirit of the lord is there is freedom there is freedom come out of the dark just as you are into the fullness of his love for the spirit is here let there be freedom let there be
as you are into the fall.